Um, hello, welcome to my talk, uh, Hobby to Full-Time Instructor, or my preferred title, How to Be a Professional Drop Zone Bum. Um, I recognise a few people, hello, um, <laughs> but not everyone. So I'm Emily, I work at Skydive Langer as a Category System and AFF Instructor. I'm also a camera flyer, so often kind of found at Drop Zone teaching students and filming tandems. Um, cool, so what I'm going to be talking about, um, it's actually probably not going to take an hour, it's probably more like half an hour, so I should give you all time to go to the bar before your next talk. I'm going to be talking about um, making the decision to work in the sport, so going from a, a fun jumper, jumping at weekends, kind of going to boogies, going on jumping holidays, to deciding to work in the sport and trying to make a career out of it. So part of that is talking about the process of getting an instructor rating as well. And I'll use a bit of my own experience to explain how that works. And I'll also be talking about living the dream, kind of expectations and reality, kind of pros and cons. Uh, some of you, like me, might be wondering why I was asked to talk about it. And I suppose it's because it's what I've just done over the last couple of years. So two years ago, I moved to the drop zone um, at new, around New Year time. And I had at the time, I had about 400 jumps and an FS coach rating. Um, I didn't even have a rig at the time, so I didn't plan that very well. But I, um, I had a bit of an idea of what I wanted to do. I knew I enjoy enjoyed coaching and that maybe becoming an instructor was something that I'd like to do, but I didn't have much of an idea of how to go about it. And I actually went to a talk that year at the AGM by Andy Pointer, who, pretty similar to me, was talking about working in the sport and getting instructor ratings. And I found that quite a helpful talk, so hopefully, my talk might be helpful for someone here. Fingers crossed. Um, so you've got to start somewhere, and it starts with making a decision, or at least consider making a decision. Um, deciding whether or not you want to work in the sport doesn't necessarily mean quitting your job on Monday and moving to the drop zone on Tuesday. It might just mean that, it, you, like I said, it's something that you might consider doing in the future, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll know where to start and a few things that you could start working towards now without completely quitting your job um, and moving to the drop zone. Personally, I think it's a really easy decision to consider, but quite a difficult decision to commit to. So I'm sure everyone here has had days at uni or at work where they've been sat looking out the window, it's blue skies, nil winds, and you've sat and wished that you were at the drop zone jumping and it feels very tempting to get up, walk out the office and, and go work in the sport. But I also guarantee that a lot of you think about that a little bit less when it's cold and wet and windy outside. Um, I used to be a nurse and I used to think the same. I used to go to work and it'd be sunny outside and I'd think about and daydream about quitting my job and moving to the drop zone. But actually I really enjoyed my work and so I figured you know, it was working pretty well for me, that balance between working and jumping at the weekends. I then went travelling and found that when I was kind of having an awesome time, even sat on a beach in the sun, I still wanted to be at the drop zone, even though I knew back at that time, it was kind of November, that being at the drop zone would probably be bad weather. But I still had that in the back of my head the whole time, so I thought eventually that's probably what I should go and do and go be at the drop zone. Um, it's a different decision for different people. I think that depends on people's commitments. So for me, it did involve uh, packing up and moving into a caravan in a muddy field. But for some people, it might mean just committing a few more weekends around their actual work in order to, to work at the drop zone. People might have mortgages, um, might have families to consider, or even kind of serious skydiving teams that need funding and need time commitment as well. So whilst I'm talking through this, I'm using my own experience, it's worth noting that there's like a different way to do it for everyone. So once you've made your decision, you need to then think about actually making it happen. And the first steps is kind of setting some goals and making a rough plan. And these goals might be jump numbers. So you might need a few more jump numbers before you can go for ratings that you'd like to. It might be learning new skills such as camera flying, or it might be just getting stuck in and working towards some instructor ratings straight away. A good person to talk to about this is your chief instructor. They'll give you a really good idea of where you are at the moment and where you need to be to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. It's also pretty good to figure out how to fund it. So this is a step that I kind of skipped a little bit, overlooked. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes. Um, 
even if you decide to live on a, cost, uh, on a drop zone, there are still living costs, even if it's um, super cheap eating super noodles every day. Um, you still need to buy the super noodles. So figuring out how to fund it. Um, and the whole point is that you're living on a drop zone to jump. So you're still going to want to fund jump and you're still probably going to want to do some tunnel. Instructor ratings cost money as well. So you have to pay to go on courses. You might even need to pay for some of the prep for the courses as well. So having an idea of where that money is going to come, come from is good to think about before you make that step. So now I'm going to talk about instructor ratings. Um, I've already mentioned that working in the sport is most likely going to involve some sort of instructor rating. And there's three to think about. There's category system instructor, or most people know that as RAPS or static line. AFF, so accelerated free fall, and tandem. All three of those actually start with a basic instructor rating. So your basic instructor rating is the first course that you can go on. And after that, you can then start working with real students. So once you pass that course, it's essentially the BPA or British Skydiving, as they're now called, giving you the seal of approval that with a little bit of work, a little bit of um, kind of practice and input from more experienced instructors, then you have the potential to go on and pass the full course and become a fully fledged instructor. So you end up doing a CSBI in order to then become a CSI, AFFBI, so you become an AFFI, and so on. However, it's good to note that some of the basic instructor ratings will cover you for others as well. So for example, if you became a category system instructor and then later on down the line decided you wanted to become an AFF instructor, you wouldn't have to do another basic instructor course for that. But on the kind of flip side of that, if you became a tandem instructor and then decided later down the line to become an AFF instructor, you would have to do a basic instructor course for that one. So some of them cross over, but not all of them. Before you go on the BI course, there is a little bit of prep to do. Um, so as I said, I moved to the drop zone kind of around New Year time, so in January. And I went on my basic instructor course up in Strathallan in Scotland in May. So I had a few months over winter to, to do a little bit of preparation as well. I'm going to use category systems as an example because that's the first one that I did. And it's actually the first one that anyone can do. So for CSI, you need to have two years in the sport and 200 jumps, whereas for tandem, it's two years in the sport and 800 jumps, and AFF, it's two years in the sport and 1,000 jumps. So it's kind of the first one that you can go for. Beforehand, you need to have a CH coach rating. So that's canopy handling. It means that you can teach people their CH1 for their A license and CH2 for their B license. So being able to, to brief them and help them achieve the practical sides of it as well as understanding the theoretical side of it. You also need your radio license. So this means that you can then talk to the aircraft on the ground. So you suddenly become a lot more helpful to the drop zone as well. So you can start doing DZ control. You can also start doing talk down, which personally I found quite daunting. Someone explained it to me as kind of like remote control parachuting. <laughs> but then you have to remember that there's a real human being underneath the parachute that you're controlling to the ground. Um, there is a proficiency card that has several things on it, such as uh, doing talk down, so having someone observe you do that and can sign it off. Observing ground schools um, and watching as much stuff as you can, I think is a really good way of learning stuff. At this point, before the BI course, you can't work with real students. So watching other instructors, seeing how they teach, how they word things and how they explain and demonstrate things is really good a way to learn as well. Um, the other things on the proficiency card include being watched, so being examined, well not examined, but being evaluated by a more experienced or your chief instructor, um, practicing some lessons. As I just said, you can't work with real students, so you have to ask your friends very nicely to pretend to be students. And you do feel pretty silly at first, because you know that they know exactly what you're talking about, and they're going to be able to tell if, if you're talking absolute nonsense. So it feels a little bit awkward at first, but my, my kind of advice for that is to do it more. The more you do it, the, the easier it feels, the more natural it becomes. The, I think the most fun thing on that proficiency card is doing a static line jump yourself. So you have to go and be dispatched. And for some people, that might be their first ever static line jump. If you learn through AFF, you might not have done one before. Um, so it's quite a good way of getting kind of in the mindset and feeling like what it's like to feel a be a student again. Um, for me, it reminded me of kind of how awkward the kit feels, how heavy it is, and also how long you stay up there under one of those big canopies as well. Trying to land it is interesting. Practice, practice, practice. 
the more you practice, the more prepared you're going to feel for your BI course. So the BI course itself is about a week long, kind of Monday to Friday. If the weather's good, you're going to do some dispatching so that all the BI courses run together. So you might have tandem basic instructors, uh, category system basic instructors, and ASF basic instructors all there together. So you end up dispatching each other. Um, so for example, I dispatched a couple of guys that were there for their tandem basic instructor course. Um, I got dispatched by people doing their ASF basic instructor course. So I got quite lucky because it meant I got to jump my own rig, which was nice. Uh, you end up doing two lessons and one brief. The first lesson you do is you get to choose it. So it's your most comfortable one, maybe the one you've practiced the most, the one you're most confident with. And then the examiners will tell you a lesson that they want you to teach and also tell you a brief. And you teach to the other people on the course. So this is where, in your prep, when you've got used to teaching other skydivers, that comes in handy. Because, again, you know that they know what you should be teaching and, and can pick holes in it, I guess. There's an exam at the end of the week. And that's all about the ops manual and things about being students and instructor-specific stuff as well. I actually really enjoyed the BI course. Everyone says beforehand, oh, you're going to love it. It's really fun. And it's the first course you go on. So it's difficult to believe them when they say that. And you do go, I was quite stressed and nervous beforehand. But it is pretty chilled, pretty informal. And the examiners are really approachable and really, really friendly. And after each lesson, you kind of sit together, they debrief it, and they can give you some really good tips. And we had some pretty good discussions around kind of what we were teaching and why we were teaching it as well. So that was good. A uh, good tip for your BI course is to take spares of absolutely everything. So I, like I said, I went up to Strathallan up in Scotland, and my little micro was absolutely crammed full of stuff. Student rigs, maps of the drop zones, and loads of different copies of my lesson plans dotted around my car, which I was very thankful for because on the very first day, I had my folder with my original copy on the roof of my car and then drove off and never saw it again. <laughs> so I was pretty happy to have some spares. After that week, once you pass, you get given a probation period between six and 12 months. <coughs> In this period, you can just do lots of practice. You can finally start working with students. At first, you're going to be underneath direct supervision, which actually feels quite nice to know that there's a more experienced instructor there watching and can help if you get into any kind of tricky situation. It is scary. So to start off with, when you're first dispatching students and first teaching them, I found it very nerve-wracking and very stressful. But you're trying to, you're a bit like a duck on water, trying to act all kind of cool, calm and confident for your students, but underneath your heart's racing. A little bit like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, and you spend this time just developing all your skills and your confidence. And it reminded me a little bit of when I was a student. So who here is remember being nervous on their first skydive? Yeah, everyone. Who here remember being nervous on their second skydive? Yeah, it takes a little while for those nerves to go. And it's quite easy, I think, at times, especially in this probation period, and especially when you're doing category system stuff, because it's not often paid, it would be quite easy to come up with an excuse to avoid doing it. But actually, the more you do it, the more you're going to feel at ease doing it, the more confident and easy it feels to, to do that dispatching. So again, the more you do it, the better you're going to be prepared. There is another proficiency card. So that involves this time dispatching students, uh, dispatching console students, again, practicing lessons, practicing ground schools, and again, having people watch you and evaluate you. And then when you're ready, you can go on the exam course. So this is when things get a little bit more serious. It's a pretty similar structure to the BI course in that you do two lessons and a brief. There is dispatching again. I got less lucky on this one and, and had to do a static line jump, but I was pretty happy because I definitely did the best static line exit I've ever done. <laughs> um, I did the terrible landing though. I was walking back into the hangar at Hib covered in mud and I had to walk past Jeff. So Jeff's the guy that gives all the ratings. I was like, he's not gonna give me one now, <laughs> not after seeing that landing. <laughs> um, there's an exam. But this time, the exam is actually at the start of the week. So it's the very first thing you're going to do. Monday morning, you do the exam. And if you fail that, then you pack your bags and you go home. Um, but luckily, it's pretty similar to the one that you did on your BI course. So you should, you should be all good with that. At the end of the week, it is pass or fail. So if you pass, you go back to the drop zone. You have a shiny new rating. And it feels like everyone expects you to know what you're doing. But actually, nothing has changed between then and the week before. 
Um, so you're still a little bit nervous, still trying to get used to things. And actually, that's probably when more learning kind of starts. That's when you really start to get used to working with students, picking up things that help them out, so common mistakes that they make and ways of explaining how to, to prevent them from happening. Um, and I think, yeah, again, the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to get with it. If you fail, then it's not the end of the world. It just means maybe you've got a little bit more practice to do, a bit more developing, get a bit more input from your chief instructor and more experienced people around the drop zone. There are a few differences between AFF and Tandem. So AFF, the exam course, also includes evaluation jumps. So you end up doing five of them and they get scored out of four. So the maximum you can get is 20, but the minimum you need to pass is 12. And on these jumps, your examiner is going to pretend to be a poor student. So they're not going to do anything that a student wouldn't do, but they're just making sure that you can stay nice and close to them, keep them nice and safe, and also give them kind of clear and correct signals. Um, and actually, it's quite fun. It is stressful. But when you're kind of out the plane and you're actually flying, I think you kind of go onto autopilot and just crack on with the job, which is quite cool. But it does mean that beat up jumps are part of the preparation. So this is, again, where a bit more funding might come into play. You've got to pay for jumps. It might even involve a little bit of tunnel. And again, the more you do, the more prepared you're going to be for the course. I think beat up jumps kind of, you feel like you're constantly chasing your tail. You finally feel like you're getting somewhere and being close and being quick with like getting to the student. And then whoever you're doing beat up jumps with will make it even harder. So you're constantly trying to push yourself and get better. Um, tandems. So I'm not a tandem instructor. So I know a little bit, but if you have more questions about tandems, it's probably best to find an experienced tandem instructor to ask. But there isn't actually any probation between the BI course and the exam course. So if you do a BI course one week, you can then book onto the very next kind of exam course that's happening. However, there is now one after the exam course, and it's, it's for your first like 20 jumps, and it um, restricts you to like how many jumps you can do per day size of your student and what wind conditions and stuff you can do it just to ease you into doing tandems. And your first ever tandems are on the exam course. So the exam course for tandems is a little bit of a teaching course as well. They teach you how to land and how to hook things up and stuff. So now I'm going to talk about living the dream, um, kind of cutting away, making a living, and uh, what you can expect as well. <laughs> I do wonder if... <laughs> If I made this presentation in summer, I would probably reference the weather a little bit less. Um, but it's definitely on my mind at the moment. <coughs> so money. You've got you've to pay the bills. <laughs> you've got to, um, like I said, fund how you're living and th these courses and your prep for the courses. And earning your millions, it's not going to happen, especially when you start with a category system instructor rating. Um, but... I don't think anyone goes into skydiving to, to earn their millions. Um, so, but there's options. So you could look at other jobs on the drop zone. So maybe you could become a packer. Maybe you could work in Manifest or the office, do some ground crew. That all gives you time on the drop zone. However, a lot of those jobs mean that you're working when everyone else is jumping. So me personally, I was a little bit reluctant to do that because the whole point of living on the drop zone was to jump as much as I could. Um, and luckily, like I said earlier, I started on the drop zone with an FS coach rating. So that was something that I could do over the summer, was loads and loads of coaching. It meant that I kept jumping and I kept working with students and being able to kind of refine how I was briefing and debriefing them um, to help me prepare for my instructor ratings as well. I also went down the route of getting credit cards, which <laughs> I was told I wasn't allowed to sell anything in this presentation, but I wasn't told I wasn't allowed to give poor financial advice. Um, <laughs> And for me, it was a little bit of a risk because I decided to get credit cards so that I could buy some camera wings and a camera setup as well, so that that was another skill that I could do. Um, taking the risk that hopefully, if I hung around long enough, someone would eventually start paying me and giving me a job. And it worked. It paid off. <laughs> um, but like I said, it's a little bit of a risk. Or you can keep a real job. So there's pros and cons, I think, of keeping a real job, maybe even a real house made of bricks and with indoor plumbing. <laughs> It'd be good. Um, or being a drop zone bum. So keeping a real job, you get a bit more budget, a bit more flexibility, probably a little bit more comfortable when it's raining outside, but you spend less time on the drop zone. And I think that's the real perk of living on the drop zone and being a drop zone bum, is that you're around all the time, 
And time spent on the drop zone, I think, is absolutely invaluable. Even when you're not jumping, there's people to ask like questions, people to talk to, people to, to, to discuss uh, lots of different topics around students and instructing. Um, however, especially this time of year, there is a high risk of trench foot. <laughs> so living the dream, expectation and reality. I think everyone, when it's difficult to know what you're getting yourself in for. And I know at times I probably thought, oh, it's going to be you know, full of sunset jumps, I'm going to be jumping all day, every day, shorts, t-shirt, flip-flops, landing on the beach, even though there isn't a beach at Langer, like you have this whole like daydream in your head of what it's going to be like, and actually, it doesn't always live up to that, and it is, it is a work, it, it, is, it is a job, it is work, and some days are awesome, some days you wake up and you're jumping all day, you go to bed at night, and I always think sometimes you get the same feeling as when you're a kid and you've been playing out all day, you go to bed and you're like, ah, yeah, that was a good day. That's good. Um, some days are still pretty good, but you end up running around, you're on your feet all day, you feel like you're super busy, you talk all day, you get to the end of the day and you think, oh, I've been so busy, I'm knackered, I must have done loads of jumps. And you count it up and you've done like two. <laughs> but you've actually spent lots of time with students. And for me, actually, that's part of a perk of the job as well, is working with students and seeing them progress. But sometimes when you have days like that and everyone else is jumping loads, it can feel a little bit like you get the, the kind of raw end of the deal being on the ground. But I think that's how you look at it as well, the positive outlook and all that. Um, sacrificing fun jumps for work jumps. Again, a lot of, a lot of your friends are going to turn up at the weekends. It's their hobby still and it's their place that they go to fun jump. Um, but actually, they're turned up to your place of work at your busiest time of the week. Um, so often you say hi to them in the morning and then you don't see them again till the end of the day and then they have loads of like stories to tell you about their fun jumps, maybe their carnage jumps, things that went wrong, things that went well and you've spent the day filming tandems and so that's a little bit less interesting to talk about to them. Um, or maybe they're talking about planning a sunset lift and you want to go join them but actually you've just dispatched a load of students so you need to spend time with your students on the ground debriefing and maybe briefing them again. So sometimes you do miss out on that. And that's where it is trading the best hobby in the world for what is, in my opinion, the best job in the world. And that's actually something that Andy Pointer said in the presentation that I went to see a couple of years ago. And it's always been in the back of my mind that it is a job, but it's the best job. And at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? And for me, it absolutely is, 100%, no doubt about it. Challenges. Winter. Winter is a challenge, um, especially when you're working in the UK. No one wants to be on a drop zone when it's bad weather, but if it's where you live, then that means often it's very quiet, sometimes a little bit isolating and often a bit boring and lots of sitting around drinking tea and watching films. When you go to family events, often get asked, when are you getting a real job? Or my grandma always asks, how's the nursing going? And I have to have the same conversation every time I see her. Oh, I'm not doing that anymore, grandma. <laughs> I've decided to live in a field in a caravan <laughs> to jump out of planes. Um, but it's all good. <laughs> um, so yeah, you often, luckily, I'm very lucky. My, fa my family have been pretty supportive. And I don't think my mum fully understands why I want to do it, but she's not questioned it too much. Uh, Work-life balance can be difficult. And I don't I I'm not entirely sure whether I think this is necessary. Some would argue that it is, but work and life, they're a bit smushed together, I think, when you work in skydiving, because if I wasn't working, I'd still want to be on the drop zone and I'd still want to be jumping. So it's a difficult balance <coughs> to have. I think it's a bit of a grey area. and um, Yeah, some would say it's necessary. I'm not entirely sure if it is. But in summer, for example, it's quite easy to get carried away and realise that actually you might not have had a day off for three weeks and actually you're more tired than you think. So just remembering to take a little bit of time to, to chill out in summer, even though you have a lot of time to chill out in winter is important. Um, and winter again. <laughs> <laughs> so what next? Um, if any of you guys are thinking this is the route that you want to go down, then make a plan. And even if it's, like I said, not necessarily quitting your job, handing in your resignation on Monday so you can move into a caravan, on Tuesday, maybe you need to put a few more wheels in motion first. Maybe you need to jump more, get your jump numbers up. Look at getting a coach rating, because that's great for, again, still jumping at weekends, keeping it as a hobby, 
but getting introduced into working with students and how all that kind of works, deciding whether or not that's what you like to do. Talk to your chief instructor, talk to experienced, other experienced instructors. You can talk to me, I'm around for the rest of the day and easily contactable on Facebook, so just drop me a message. I'm always happy to give people advice. Um, yeah, just ask people. This is a list of the BI courses for this year, just in case anyone is interested. Um, in October, we've got one at Langer where the f it's for the first time it's going to be a female-led course as well. So it'll be female examiners in case people feel more comfortable in that environment. We also have a weekend in October that's open for absolutely everyone with free talks, seminars, practical sessions talking about coaching, instructor ratings, other skills as well, such as rigging, packing, load organising and all that stuff. Does anyone have any questions? No? Cool. <laughs> 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 um, cool, so that's it, all done. Um, that gives you plenty of time to go to the bar and get a drink before you go to the next talk. Cool.